I'm Dr. Jennifer finlayson Fife, and I'm a licensed psychotherapist, and I work with individuals and couples on relationship and sexuality challenges in their lives and in their marriages. I also teach online courses, uh, particularly designed for LDS or Mormon couples and individuals, on how to improve one's emotional relationship, one's sexual relationship, and in particular, of course, for women on many of the things I'm talking about today, which is how to forge a stronger sense of self, a deeper connection with one's body and one's sexuality, and to uh, be more at peace in one's sexual uh, self. Today, in particular, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to foster and maintain a sexual sense of self as a mother, and particularly as a new mother. For many women in my practice, this is more challenging than they anticipate. They may have felt plenty of desire prior to having a baby, but once that little person comes along, it suddenly can feel much harder to maintain the sense of sexuality and desire. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today about some of the factors that interfere with desire and then what you can do about it or what some of the antidotes might be to it. The first is probably what we all sort of know instinctively and understand is that there's biological and logistical challenges when you have a little person that you're taking care of. The biological challenges of having just given birth, for example, are the hormonal shifts that often impact desire and the pure fatigue um, that when our biological selves are compromised, it's going to impact desire. And so just not getting enough rest and so on or having time to exercise is going to impact the body and impact desire. The logistical challenges, of course, are there, which is just having time when you know no one's going to wake up or need your attention or need your energy and being able to cr carve out that space that was so easy to find prior to having children now is much more challenging. Of course, those realities are there, and I think the couples who do best have some patience for it, as well as look to create space, look to, they, they, they legitimize it in themselves, to create space and time to be with their spouse and to not always be, you know, 100% on as a mother and so on. Or they make time to get the rest they need or get the exercise they need that impacts their body. But the thing I want to focus on most today is on the identity and relational challenges that happen when you have a, a, a baby and how this impacts sexual desire. And I think I'll talk a bit about this identity shift is as welcome and as happy as you may be about becoming a parent. I think we're often unprepared for its impact on our sense of self and our sense of identity. And so many of us are shifting if, from a sense of being a, a woman and a person who was just responsible for herself or responsible in a marriage to now taking on the notions of motherhood. And, and oftentimes we will take on um, ideas that we've inherited, often unwittingly, about what it is to be a good mother, what it is to be a good woman as a mother. And I think that we don't often see, but it exists, this idea that good mothers, meaning motherhood and sexuality don't mix, or that is to say good mothers are not that interested in sexuality and pleasure. Um, and that similarly, or sort of an extension of this, is that good mothers are selfless and self-denying and put the needs and the priorities of others first, and that's sort of a defining characteristic of their goodness. So I think for a lot of people who believe this or, or maybe just have sort of inherited and haven't even really thought about it, this will start to play out in that if they grew up with a sense that sexuality is evil or it's a threat to goodness or a threat to security within a family, in an effort to be protective of your child, you want to kind of put it away uh, not really have it be a fundamental part of your sense of self or a part of your life. And some of us just inherited that from parents or family who were ambivalent about sexuality or gave messages that it was destructive. Others uh, may have had experiences of sexual exploitation and how sex was actually hurtful to them. So that instinct to protect a child is very, very high when you're a new parent. And I think for many people, this unwittingly even is a way of trying to create a space that feels safe 
from the sort of darker aspects of sexuality. I think that this other factor of the selfless model, that I should throw my whole self into my parenting, throw my whole self into being a good mother if I'm going to really do this right. And many of us start losing track of our own desires, our own interests, our own development as a person in the interest of fostering the development of another person. And clearly, some of this is necessary and important. Uh, clearly, when we are um, doing a good job as a parent, we're going to put aside a lot of our interests. For example, you may be interested in sleeping at 2 in the morning, not getting up and nursing a baby, but that suppression of your desires is fundamental to doing a good job often, which is, okay, I may want to sleep, but it's more important that I get up and do what my child needs to thrive. And so some of that's absolutely necessary throughout parenting, is that you're going to sacrifice what you want for the greater good or for what the needs are of the child. But some of us take this so far that there is a kind of profound suppression of self. And we're not really, we don't feel like a woman. We feel more like a mother at all times. And our interests are revolving around the interests and needs of our child only, not around ourselves anymore. And when we do this in the extreme, it can definitely, because our belonging to our sense of self is so fundamental to sexual desire, that when we sort of distance from our sense of self as an individual and as a separate person, it's a lot harder to sustain um, or create a sexual interest. So um, the third thing I would say uh, that's a factor is the relational challenges. And oftentimes when people transition into motherhood, they do it in a way, the couple does it in a way that interferes with the happiness in the couple. So when people do it well, the mother and father recognize that they share in this desire, they are both equally invested in being good parents, and even if they're taking on different roles, there is a shared um, value, a shared project of doing right by these children. And, um, and so they will each be making sacrifices for the benefit of the children or for benefit of the other parent that's doing things to support the kids. And so there's still a strong sense of partnership as you parent. Couples who don't do it well, there is kind of an imbalance in how this happens, and it <clears throat> um, can go one or both of these ways, which is that the father, you know, the mother may make this psychological transition into being a mother or being a parent, but the father, who's not as often as biologically involved in it, right, he's not, not carrying a baby within him, uh, sometimes doesn't create this transition in the same way. And so he sees the baby as a threat to his attention and his um, acknowledgement by his wife, and the baby kind of becomes the one he competes with. And, um, and so the mother feels like, you know, you're not really understanding what I'm doing and what I'm going through and how challenging this is, and you just resent it. The other challenge, and these can go together, of course, is that a mother makes the relationship with the child all important. And... The, her energy and her attention and her interests all start to revolve around the baby and to the exclusion of or the detriment of the partnership. And so either one of these things will really undermine the happiness within a couple. So what's the antidote to all of these factors? Um, the, what I think is we have to first challenge the idea that uh, the suppression of self is a virtue. In my experience, this is even if you're going to focus on exclusively on how to be a good parent, suppression of self interferes with good parenting. Because first of all, you don't give a model to your children of how to be a whole person. You're teaching your daughters how to be in this kind of self-compromised position as adults which undermines their development, their well-being, their happiness. You're also teaching boys how to relate to women, that women should somehow uh, serve at their own expense, essentially. Uh, beyond that, if you revolve your life so deeply around your children that you aren't paying attention to this other aspect, which is belonging to your own development, your sense of self, your sense of self as an individual, 
you will do one or both of these two things, which is resent your children for the ways that you kind of lost important aspects of yourself in the effort of parenting. And or you will make your children responsible for managing your sense of legitimacy. And so you'll want their choices to validate that you are a good mother, that you've done uh, well in the world. You'll want them to reinforce you in some way. And this undermines children's development because they either feel their, their mother's resentment towards them and dislike for them, or they feel that they have to support and prop up their mother's sense of self. And this interferes with them do, you know, doing what they need to do, which is move into full adulthood and take responsibility for their own lives. So, so we have to challenge the sense that this is good parenting and that this is good for our families. Maintaining a sense of self in that tension, and it isn't at the expense of our children either, but maintaining a sense of self is really important for your children feeling free. And it's also really fundamental to sexual interest and sexual desire. Many women talk about what their sexual desire is linked to feeling at peace in their own bodies, at peace in their own skin, that they like themselves. Self-respect is a very important aphrodisiac. And when we neglect ourselves and we neglect our development, it's very hard to hold that no matter how much validation we're getting from our spouse. Our spouse may be telling us we're just attractive and wonderful and they love us in every sense, but if we don't carry that sense within ourselves, it's very hard to believe it or generate that within ourselves. So this is a very, very important thing for us to do. The second thing that we have to challenge is the idea that sexuality is inherently bad or inherently threatening. Clearly, sexual behavior, people can use sexuality to do really destructive things, self-destructive and other destructive things. It's a, it's, a, it's a very powerful way to be destructive if you are exploitative in some way with sexuality. But sexuality can also clearly be a deep source of strength, rejuvenation, peace within a relationship, a deep way to love and be loved. And so <clears throat> a lot of times we kind of manage our anxiety about sexuality by just keeping arm's length from it, as opposed to really thinking about what am I creating and doing through my sexuality and through my sexual relationship? And how can I make what is happening here better? Something that creates more goodness in my life or in my marriage, creates and offers more strength to me, right? Um, and then the third antidote in similar to both of these is what am I creating in my marriage and what's happening there that I need to address and make better? A lot of people relate to sexuality as something you do for a spouse. And so if they're spending all day taking care of the needs and desires of children and then they think at night they're now supposed to take care of the needs and desires of a husband, of course, they're not going to have desire. You know, you need a break sometimes. <laughs> okay. Uh, but if you think about sexuality as a way to be nurtured, a way to be cared for, a way to be given to, a way to be rejuvenated after the end of a long day of caring for young kids, how do I, you know, can I shift the way I think about what sex can be in my life, that it would create more goodness and strength in my life? And what would I need to change or challenge in my relationship and the way we put our relationship together? as a, a husband and wife or as a partnership and, and make it better, make it different. So because you, you can look at how you may be misaligned as a couple and challenge some of those um, patterns that you've created to make it more shared, even if you're doing different things in your lives, that you're sharing more of a sense of equality and you're creating a sexual relationship that's sustaining and good for both of you and as a reflection of both of your desires. So, so I would encourage you to think about, you know, what is it that in listening to this, what is it that I want to challenge in my own life? What is it in my relationship to uh, my sense of self do I think I need to challenge or change? Is there some way in which I'm neglecting my own well-being, my own development, my own peace of mind in the context of being a mother? And what do I realize I need to challenge or do differently to be happy within myself, independent of my roles as a partner or as a parent? Uh, the second question is, what might I need to do or think about differently in my relationship to sexuality? How do I think about sexuality? Do I think of it as something that's destructive or potentially damaging? 
And is there some way that I could challenge my instinctive response to it and change it and create more goodness through sexuality in my life, both by what I'm creating and doing with my spouse, but also what I'm willing to kind of receive and, and allow to bless me, bless my life, the true pleasure, through joy that can come through sexuality. A third question is, what might I need to address in my marriage and in the way my husband and I have partnered that needs to be challenged or changed to make it less likely to create resentment in me, right? What, what's going to create um, my deeper happiness here that would make being sexual with you a nice idea for me? And so what it, not going in just to be critical and mean, of course, but what can I actually stand up for and name and address that I think is important to create a sexual relationship that I truly desire and could bless my life and your life, husband's life. So those are the questions I would encourage you to really reflect on and think about. And then I would ask you to make a commitment to changing at least one thing. Sometimes, you know, you get a lot of information and especially if you're going through the seminar series, you're thinking probably lots of new ideas and lots of things you could do differently. And I would encourage you to focus on one thing that you know you need to change around your relationship to yourself and or your sexuality and or your sexual relationship that you want to do differently and make a commitment to doing that. And I would also encourage you to do it in a particular way, not I really should get out and exercise more, not that. Instead, do it in the frame of identity, which is I, this is who I am. This is my better self. This is my higher self. I am a woman who takes good care of her body through how, what, how she nourishes it and how she engages it physically. Therefore, I exercise three to four times a week, something like that, so that you're actually taking what it is that you know you want to address and putting it in a positive kind of identity frame. It makes it easier for you to reach towards it, not in this guilt-inducing, I really should be different, but no, I aspire, I want to embrace this identity. This is my better self. This is the self that I want to be. This is part of creating more peace and sustainability within our own psyches and being less dependent on our children or spouses to sustain our sense of self. So, so decide on one thing you want and frame it in this positive frame. Before I stop, I just want to say it's really my hope that you know we have a lot of negative messages in my view around what it is to be a good woman, what it is to be sexual, and these two often come together in a way where we are distanced and compromised in our distance from our bodies and compromised in our relationship to ourselves. It's really my wish for the well-being of you as women and for the well-being of our children that you will um, embrace the goodness of really sustaining your own development, your own uh, sense of self, and your own peace of mind through a, um, a deeper integration with your desires and your sexuality and really to embrace the strength that lies there for you. I think as women in particular, being when we're not at peace in our own bodies and not at peace with our sexuality, we compromise a fundamental strength, a strength that we really need to be at peace and at home in our own bodies. And so it's really my hope that you can forge more of this in your life. And I hope some of these ideas are helpful to you. And if you want to, um, in my online course, The Art of Desire, addresses a lot of these questions and challenges uh, for women and gives you really concrete ways to see them in your own life and how to address them better in your life. So I hope this is helpful. It's been my pleasure to talk to you. Bye-bye.